Uh, hi! Before I start today's episode, I would like to apologize in advance for all of the video encoding problems. Uh, because of the nature of what I'm about to do, there is a lot of small moving objects on the screen, which completely ruins the encoding. Uh, I think Tom Scott can explain better than me, so uh, I'll uh, put the link to his video on the topic in the description. Uh, so I, I couldn't solve the problem. Uh, no matter how much bitrate I would throw at it, it still persists. But I still would like to upload today's episode because I think I said a lot of uh, interesting and educational things. Uh, at least the things that I wanted to put out there. So um, I hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another recreation programming session with Azuzin. So today we continue working on Musualizer, which is music visualizer we started to work some time ago. And it's a it's a classical visualizer for, for music, right? Essentially what it does. It uh, analyzes the uh, frequency of the sound wave and does the FFT on that uh, on that sound wave and just like displays each individual frequency. Uh, it works. It works quite well. Uh, nothing particularly special. People done something like that uh, many times um, in the past, right? So this is nothing new. Right, but I decided to implement that anyway because uh, I never implemented that. And how are you supposed to learn things if you just don't implement them because somebody already done that? Right, so <laughs> somebody done a lot of different things. So does that mean that you never have to learn these things? No, it doesn't make any sense to me. So, uh, right, so it works well, it works well. But from the, uh, from the visual, from the artistic point of view, it kind of sucks. Honestly, right. So from the technical point of view, uh, we know that the math and everything like works correctly uh, and everything's fine, but visually, it's not that interesting to look at. It's not even that pleasant to look at. Like, look at this green, it's just like, it sucks. It straight up sucks. Uh, we need to fix that. Uh, so the, the first problem that I would like to address today uh, is basically the visualization being so glitchy and jittery. Uh, in case of a chiptune, it, it's fine, right, because it's a, it's a fast, fast-paced fast chiptune, so it kind of suits uh, this particular style of music. But if we take something uh, less fast-paced, for example, I have this uh, music from Pilot Red Sun, uh, right, so... It, it, doesn't really suit it that well, right? As you can see, it just like jumps around and jitters and stuff like that, and it's just like something's flickering here, um, right? So I don't really like how it looks like. So, and essentially, uh, this is because on each individual frame, we're showing the immediate values of the frequencies. So essentially, we have this sort of like a ring buffer uh, of samples of the sound, and uh, periodically we get new samples and we sort of push them into that buffer. And then on each frame we do an FFT on that entire thing and we just immediately display whatever we got from FFT and that is it. Uh, right, so, and as far as I know, this is not even how majority of these visualizers even work, right? So they never display the immediate value. What they do, they basically keep track of the values from the previous frame and the current frame, and they sort of try to interpolate smoothly between these things, uh, which results is in less jittering, and it just actually looks very smooth and nice and stuff like that. And this is something that we may try to do as well. Uh, right, as the first step in improving, um, you know, the visualization. I already done that uh, on a stream, but unfortunately I screwed up with the sound, so um, I was actually <laughs> right, um, keeping my headphones too close to, to the microphone, which resulted in, a, in this thing being, like, not particularly watchable, in my opinion. Uh, right, so uh, this time I fixed that mistake, but I still want to walk through the process because I think it's pretty important to document it. So let's go ahead and do that. It's actually not, not, not a big deal, right? So it's super easy to do. Um, right, so let's go to the plug. Let's see. And here we have uh, several buffers that we work with, right? So, for example, we have two input buffers and two output buffers. Uh, so the input row is literal, contains literally samples that we receive periodically from the um, from the the callback, uh, which is called by the music subsystem, by the sound subsystem, uh, periodically, right? So periodically we receive some frames and we just like put them into this buffer. 
So then uh, we have in windowed buffer and essentially what, what it is, it's just like we take the raw input and we multiply them by this hand value, which is basically the, the hand window function. For more information what it is, I recommend watching the previous episode where we discussed all of that. Uh, the, all of the episodes are going to be in the description in the form of a playlist and stuff like that. And then we take this windowed input and we do an FFT which uh, results in getting the raw output, right, the raw output. And what we do is that we actually squash that output on a logarithmic scale. We don't display all of the samples because uh, the human ear does not perceive the frequencies linearly, right? So we perceive them logarithmically. And that's what we're trying to do in here, basically squashing them into like a small amount of frequency beams. Uh, so in reality, as far as I know, we have 2 to the power of 13 uh, frequencies in here, but we don't display all of them as you can see. So this is definitely not to the power of 13, which is like I think 8,000 uh, If I'm not mistaken, right? So 2 to the power of 13 is like it's literally 8,000 of them, right? So it doesn't look like 8,000. That's for sure. <laughs> so that's because we squash them uh, Right, and we display a small amount of them and another interesting thing we do afterwards, we're normalizing them uh, to, uh, to a range from 0 to 1. Uh, and it's quite important because it makes it easier to interpolate and display it. Uh, right, for example, in here, just because each individual bar in here is value from 0 to 1, it's super easy to multiply that value by 2 thirds and just map it to 2 thirds of the screen, right? So for instance, if I want to, I can uh, map it to half of the screen, right? And it's super easy to do, right? So now it's only half of the screen. Uh, but personally, I kind of like uh, like two thirds of the screen. I think it looks nice, uh, right? So, and that's the power of basically normalized values. Uh, and afterwards, we, we just displayed all of that, right? So that's basically what it is. So the idea is, uh, we can say that this is the immediate values that we got after FFT. And let's actually introduce another buffer, which is going to be the smoothed values, the current values. So, uh, when we uh, finished computing and squashing and normalizing everything, one of the things we can do, we can essentially iterate through all of the samples we got. So we get M samples. M is the amount of squashed samples, right? So N is the amount of like the whole amount of samples, 8,000. And M is basically the squashed one. So we have less samples in here. Uh, and essentially we can say that log I uh, is the target that log uh, like uh, smooth I should achieve. Right, we can kind of compute the direction and the velocity in which out smooth house has to move by just basically subtracting them and uh, right and just multiplying by dt, right? So basically the delta time between the frames and essentially just add this entire thing uh, to the out smooth. And when we're displaying uh, everything, we're actually displaying out smooth. So yeah, essentially the immediate value kind of dictates the frequency right it dictates the frequency uh, so and to be fair this kind of uh, velocity is rather um, rather slow so uh, let me actually show you so let me, let me try to recompile this entire thing so we don't have dt uh, let's quickly compute it so here on each individual frame we already get the width and height of the window so in here we can just get the dt which is get frame time or time frame i don't quite remember it's a frame time, okay. So yeah, as you can see, it's pretty slow, right? It doesn't really keep up super well. We can multiply it by some sort of a factor uh, to make it a little bit faster. We can multiply it by two, uh, right? So, and so like, yeah, it's already way better. Uh, we can multiply it by maybe four, right? The, the bigger that value is, the closer it is, is to like jittering. Right, so we can even call this parameter something like smoothness, uh, smoothness, uh, and maybe extract it some way here. Uh, so, like maybe let's put six in here. So this is a special parameter that we can work with. Um, and I, to be fair, personally, I like the smoothness, uh, smoothness around eight. I think that's the the perfect balance. And yeah, 
So that's basically how you smooth those values. You just keep track of them. And if we take a look at the uh, fast-paced uh, chiptune, even fast-paced chiptune already looks nice. <laughs> right. Look at it. That's so cool. Alright, so uh, I don't really like these sort of like gaps between the uh, bars. Uh, I think it's super easy to get rid of them uh, if we essentially take the cell width, right? So cell width didn't really divide properly by M, right? So essentially we take the uh, size of the window and we divide it by the amount of like squashed samples that we have in here, but it didn't divide evenly. So uh, that's what results in this sort of gaps. Uh, so what we can do, we can just put seal on it and that should kind of solve the, yeah, there we go. So the gaps are kind of solved. Uh, all right, so I really like how it looks like. So let's go back to a little bit like a slower paced music, right? So as much as I like Null's songs, like I absolutely love them, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Null's work. Uh, unfortunately, when we, you're trying to visualize Chiptune, Chiptune has a lot of uh, harmonics, as you can see in here. And th this is because in chiptune you primarily use uh, square waves, right, and the sawtooth waves and stuff like that, and they result in a lot of harmonics. And because of that, when you're trying to do FFT visualization on them, they're just like turn into like a white noise, and it just like so like upsets me so much because I'm a huge fan of chiptune, but using FFT is just so hard to like visualize, and you know. Get, get up like a give a proper treatment to this music uh so maybe like using fft for visualizing chiptune is just not a great idea and you need to visualize chiptune completely differently uh maybe just on the level of like individual nodes right because like a pure fft results in um in too many harmonics by the way if anyone knows how to solve that problem pl please let me know in the comments because maybe i'm just like not aware of some certain technique that you can apply along with fft to get rid of an unnecessary harmonics is this something like that uh i'm pretty sure people been studying uh, like in that area something right so just getting rid of unnecessary harmonics to just like display and visualize uh, you know things like chiptune a little bit better uh, that would be interesting, actually. That would be actually interesting. All right. So, and because of that, sometimes to test this entire thing properly, I need to resort to things that are not cheap tuned, unfortunately. Uh, right. <clears throat> okay. So, all right. So, since we are doing the artistic work, right. So, what great artists usually do? Well, they still. <laughs> Right. Another idea that I would like to incorporate into into the visualizer, I actually saw on uh, on Twitter. Right. So I'm gonna keep the tweet in the description. It is uh, made by Rainbow Rainbowism. Uh, right. So they basically got inspired by my visualizer series, and they um, introduced uh, like a spectrogram visualizer into the into their uh, fantasy. Um, fantasy chip i think uh unfortunately i can't really access this uh tweet right because it's on twitter and twitter is banned in my country because it contains a very dangerous nato propaganda that my uh, government is batshit scared of uh but i used a little bit of the vpn magic and i actually downloaded that video so i can show it uh on on the on the stream it's not really a stream it's an offline session but anyway so i just want to show you show you how it looks like uh right so let me make it a little bit smaller so this is how it looks like so this is how dangerous nato propaganda looks like <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so the, the idea here is that uh, so we basically map each individual bar to like a, to, to a rainbow color, and, and it looks super nice. I really like how it looks like. Uh, so and as an artist, I'm going to steal that. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So <laughs> and that answers the questions whether uh, whether AI art is actually a real art. 
So you need to answer the question, is that a theft? If that's a theft, that's art. <laughs> I'm joking. So anyway, uh, so I really like this idea. It just like makes it like look good immediately. Um, and it's actually super easy to implement, right? So essentially you just iterate each individual bar and you map the iteration to a range from zero to one, the magical range, my, my favorite range. And then you use that range as a hue in a, a color in a color space of H HSV, right? So hue saturation value. Um, so, and... <laughs> that one, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, hue saturation value. Uh, why is it in Russian? Can, can you just like give me... Thank you very much. Uh, so, and... Uh, um, Essentially, that color representation is actually very cool. I really like this color representation uh, because for human beings, it is easier to reason about uh, the colors in terms of HSL and HSV rather than in RGB, right? Because here we have hue, which is the base color, right? The base color. Saturation is basically the amount of that color, like how much of that color we have. And lightness is basically how bright or dark it is. And this is a very easy way for human brain to reason about the color. Like we think about, okay, here is the base color. And then to weaken the situation and lightness, I get the sort of like uh, the right flavor of that color for my particular situation. As with RGB, it's kind of difficult to do this kind of stuff. So you constantly need to remember like, uh, what's the color of a uh, mix of red and green? Is it yellow? Yeah, it is yellow. And if more than that, it's just like, it's, it's too difficult for human brain. So, but RGB is really great for storing the color in computers. So I always say that RGB is for computers and HSL and HSV and stuff like that is for humans, right? So, and, uh, because of that, it is super easy to map this sort of like a width space to a hue color space and just get this rainbowish effect like very, very easily. So let's go ahead and try to do that. Um, should be pretty straightforward. The music is too loud yet again. Um, keeping the right volume of the music is probably the hardest part of this series, right? <laughs> because quite often I'm, I may get zoned out and come like crank up the music too high and completely forget about it and ruin the entire world. It's just like so frustrating. I'm, I'm sorry. Anyway, so essentially here uh, we're iterating from I to M and uh, it should be very easy to just say, okay, the hue is going to be equal to I divided by M. And there we go. So as far as I know, in, in Rayleap there is a thing that converts, um, you know, uh, HSV to RGB. And maybe what we can do, we can use Google to actually find that. Can I, can I do that? So where is my Google? Uh, so it's probably somewhere here. Yeah, here's the Google. And first thing I have to provide, I have to provide the path to Rayleap, which is located somewhere here. So uh, Ray, Raylib. Yeah, there we go. And the thing, I know that the thing is supposed to return color and it accepts like three floats. Uh, will it be able to find that? We should be able to find that. Um, so, could not open file. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. Just a second because I had experimentation with Google. So let me quickly, I need to recompile my Google. So there we go, should be fine. Mm -hmm. And let's go back and I'm going to do that one more time. And uh, there we go. So the first, yeah, there we go. Color from HSV instantly found instantly. That's why I developed Google, right? So I can quickly, I, I don't remember the name of this entire thing, right? I don't remember, but I do remember the signature. I, I, how can I, yeah. I, I remember the signature. I know that it accepts three floats, hue saturation value and returns the color. Uh, right, so and that's what I said to the to the search tool and it gave me like a code from HSV. So it, it's very useful for this sort of like a fuzzy, uh, fuzzy stuff, right? So here it is, and I just can grab this entire thing. And yeah, there we go, already using the tools that I created. Uh, so this is the color, uh, here is the hue, and in terms of saturation, I don't know. 
Uh, let's actually bring them to separate parameters. Value is not necessarily equal to brightness, to be fair. I don't really remember what is value. Uh, so let's just keep them like this. And instead of green, instead of green, we're going to be using the color. So let's uh, let's recompile this entire stuff. I have to go back. Uh -huh. Where is the build? Here we go. And it is red. It is absolutely red, which doesn't make any sense because I know why. Uh, because this is the, like a reoccurring theme in Rayleap is that uh, every time you have an angle, it is actually in degrees rather than rads. So yeah, hue is the angle in a sort of like a coral wheel, color wheel. So that's why it's from 0 to 360. So to get the right value of hue, we need to multiply this entire thing to on by 360. So that's what we need to do in here. Uh, and we go. Uh, we got the rainbow, but it's too harsh in my opinion. So uh, can we actually? So if I try to reduce the value, so what's going to happen? I'm really curious. It kind of makes it darker. Uh, okay, so that probably makes sense. So it's it's kind of like a brightness, and I suppose value of one is the full brightness. Yeah, you see how easy it is to reason about the color in terms of like HC. Uh, it's super easy. So and it's too saturated. I would like to make it less saturated. Maybe like eighty percent. Uh, that's already better. Maybe even a little bit more. Uh, something like this. Right. So. You, you basically pick the base color and you essentially just like modify that base color with two parameters and it's really useful. All right. So that, that already looks so much nicer than whatever we had before, seriously. Uh, and we can even compare uh, with whatever we had before. We can just stash the entire thing. And th this is what we had before. Literally, this is what we had before. And uh, now if we unstash, uh, and just like pop it in here, recompile it one more time, and this is what we have now. Like two simple changes, just like smoothness and a little bit of a, like a color variation, and it's already interesting to look at. It's already like much better than it was before. It's kind of cool. So this is what all like sort of like art is all about. Like these small little changes, small little details, have so much impact sometimes, right? So and I suppose the the job of the artist is finding these sort of like small tricks and small little tools that have a lot of impact and just like stir the whole thing to a right direction. So I suppose that's what it means to be an artist. <laughs> So let's do a committee committee. All right. So um, let me see. Maybe I can actually commit that separately. So so here we're gonna have um, you know smooth a smooth interpolation. Uh, smoothly interpolate interpolate uh, the frequency bars. Right. Uh, and still a cool uh, color idea from Twitter. So this is another. Might as well actually give the link to whoever I stole it from, right? So let me quickly do that. So this is basically where we stole it from. Uh, there we go. So and I'm going to push that right into the repo. So that's already better, but it's still, I think, not enough, right? Um, still not enough to look particularly interesting or stand out. And I would like to implement the idea that had been brewing for quite some time already, right? I was trying to come up with different sort of visualization uh, ideas over the past like a week or so. I've been experimenting with different stuff and I settled on one interesting idea that I think is really good. I really like that idea. Uh, right, so essentially the gist of that idea, uh, so let me actually pause this entire thing and maybe uh, get my paint. I think I already have my paint opened. So instead of like a solid bars, right? Instead of solid bars, what if we had circles, right? We had circles on different heights. Uh, I already tried to do something like that and it doesn't really work that well because the discrepancies between different frequencies might be huge. 
Right. So, but I like the idea of uh, like using circles in the uh, in the frequencies to represent the frequencies. But if there is too too much discrepancies, it just like doesn't look good. In fact, I can probably show you that. All right. I can probably show you that because I know the precise sort of like location and height of the bar, uh, which I can use to actually find the center of the circle. I can just literally render that circle. So let me quickly try to do that. So here we are drawing the rectangle. Um, drawing the rectangle. So this is X uh, of this entire thing, and this is Y. Uh, right, so I think I can do something like this. So center, uh, this is the current position. This is the current position. Um, but we need to be at the center of the bar. So because of that, I'm gonna offset it by half of the uh, of the width. Uh, and this is the height, right? And the height is gonna stay the same, right? So this is basically the height. Um, and in here, I wanna draw a circle. So I wonder if I can quickly do that. So do we have vector two, void, um, it accepts the center, radius, and probably the color, right? So this entire thing probably would look like this. And uh, there we go, draw a circle. So I literally found this entire thing. That's actually very cool. <laughs> so here's the uh, circle. Radius is going to be cell width. And the color is going to be the, the current color that we compute from HSV. Uh, right, and let me comment out the rectangle. Man, Google is so useful, right? <laughs> Because I don't remember the name of this thing, but I know that it accepts vector 2, uh, you know, the, the radius and the color, right? So, because it's a circle. Uh, right, so let's rebuild this entire thing. I'm in the wrong place. God damn it. God damn it. Uh, okay, so there we go. Uh, yeah, using circles is just like kind of cool. But if there's a huge discrepancy between um, the frequencies, it's just like it turns into a mess. And it's just like not clear what the hell is going on. Uh, right. Though it's still kind of cool. Uh, right, we can take a look at how it looks like when you do something like this. Not bad, actually. <laughs> uh. So, the way I uh, want to resolve that is basically uh, put them on a stick. Right. So that way, they combine the best of both worlds, right? Uh, using circles, because I think using circles is just like visually appealing. It's such like a perfect object, and there's a lot of them, so it feels like a lot of particles and stuff like that. It just like stimulates your brain. I really like that. Uh, and uh, with sort of like them being on a stick, creates this sort of feeling of these frequency bars, of these equalizer frequency bars. Uh, so it kind of like combines the best of both worlds, right? It's not really a bar anymore, but uh, you still can feel the height of it. Um, so we can go ahead and try to do that. If I remember correctly, <clears throat> um, Rayleap literally has a function for rendering the, the lines. Uh, so let's actually try to find that. It probably accepts two vectors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so let me see. Uh, I have to go somewhere here. Uh, draw line. There we go. <laughs> so, so easy to find. Uh, okay, so this is the start position. Uh, end position and the color. So we know the color. Uh, we know the start position, which is the center. We, we can actually rename center to the start position. Start position. There we go. I, I wonder if you can see everything. So let's actually put it in here. Yeah, there we go. I think that's a little bit better. Yeah, so the, the code is in here. Uh, right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and the visualization here. So it's quite important for you to uh, see the, the full the full line. Uh, in the end position, I suppose, in terms of X, it's literally the same. In terms of X, it's literally the same, but in terms of height, it's at the bottom, So which means it's just like H. So uh, that's basically it. I can't see Scheisse in this means. There we go. So we have uh, end position and the color. It would be nice to maybe render the line first, right? Render the line first and then the circle next. Uh, just a second. 
Alright. Uh -huh. So let's go over here. Uh -huh. There we go. So I'm not sure how well it looks on the screen. Maybe it actually creates a lot of like um how to say that, encoding artifacts and stuff like that, but it looks like this. Um, because of that, I think it, the the lines should be a little bit thicker, so let's actually get rid of them, so I'm, I don't know if they create a lot of like encoding artifacts, so just in case I'm gonna disable them, so they don't ruin the, the video. And if I remember correctly, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there was a variant of, of the line, drawing the line, that accepted the thickness uh yeah so there was a bzl line uh, i think it's basically xc yeah there we go so there is this one uh this thing that also accepts the thickness right so it accepts the start point the end point then the thickness and the color so how can we set the thickness we can set the thickness literally to cell width which will result in a very thick line I think it's gonna be the thickness of the entire um yeah of the entire bar actually no but maybe i, I don't really know so let, let me actually see um so, so it doesn't like something uh semicolon of course yeah it's too thick uh it's the thickness of the entire bar and plus the yeah the radius of the circle is also too big, so the actual radius has to be like half of that. Uh, right, now they are actually matched perfectly. To be fair, the fact that they inter... Uh, like overlap is actually quite good. Right, so I think they're... yeah. Because we have so many frequencies, they are so crammed together, but they rarely are on the same height, so because of that, the circles overlapping with each other is kind of fine. Right, we can actually make them even, like, overlap even more, like twice of that. So that looks even more interesting. And in terms of thickness, we can take this, like, half of the thickness. Uh, right. So that already looks even more interesting, right? <laughs> uh, right, we can maybe divide the thickness of this thing by three even. Uh, I think it looks even more interesting if you, like, do full screen. Right. So yeah, <laughs> that already looks interesting. So, um, but I think the radius is actually too huge, right? So if I make it a little bit smaller, uh, right? Did it? Did it actually decrease it? Ah, I, I did the wrong thing. So it's supposed to be like three, um, and this one has to be like this. Uh, there we go. So interestingly, maybe. Uh, it makes sense to factor out those parameters like so. We're gonna have float, uh, and this is gonna be thickness, which depends on the cell width, and uh, then we're gonna have a radius, which also depends on the cell width. It's literally cell width. So in that way we know what kind of parameters we are modifying. Right. So we know that the thickness is a third of the cell width, but the radius is the full thing in here. Uh, right, okay, so that already looks nice. So, let's take a look at some other music. That was pretty cool. So, the thing I didn't like is when nothing is playing, right, they all line down flat in here, right, which is like kind of, kind of, maybe it's nice, but I don't want to see anything when nothing is playing. Which brings us to another interesting idea that I got. Uh, each individual frequency is a value from 0 to 1. So it's literally interpolator. We can incorporate that interpolator into the radius of the circle. What if the radius of the circle will depend on the value of the frequency? So the more uh, the higher the amplitude of the frequency, the bigger the circle is going to be. So when it becomes zero, the circle is virtually non-existent. Uh, so I think it's a rather interesting idea. Uh, so let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. And it's super easy. So because that interpolator is T, 
right? So it, it's right here. Uh, so what we can do is just multiply it by t, and there you go. Boom. That's already looks interesting. L look how, yeah. <laughs> so that's so cool. Uh, we can do the same thing actually with the thickness. We can just multiply it by t, like so. Boom. And yeah, maybe the thickness has to be like a little bit thicker. Yeah, because you you want to be able to see this thing. And like, look how. Yeah, so there's so many things already going on, it's it's like really stimulating for your brain. Um, right. But the problem here is that already somewhere here, the circles is are actually too small. Right, so at some point they become like very difficult to see. Uh, right. And one of the things we can do, we can incorporate the idea from uh, animation easing. Do, do you guys know what it is? Right, so um, I, there was a website, there was actually pretty, a cool website on the topic. Uh, so let me find that. Animation easing. I hope I spelled it correctly. Uh, the complete guide for animation, uh, yeah, easing function. So essentially, um, you when you're animating things, right, when you're animating things, you can interpolate the value of, uh, from A to B just linearly, just like a line. But it doesn't look and it doesn't feel nice. Because of that, the animators usually interpolate them by some sort of a function. It could be like a sine wave, it could be square, it could be cube, uh, sometimes it could be um, square root and stuff like that. And on this website, you can actually get the feel of each individual function uh, and see how it um, sort of feels when you animate with it. I'm going to put it in the description as well. Um, and the cool thing about the values from 0 to 1, yet again, right, magical values that I absolutely love, is that uh, if you, for example, square the value from 0 to 1, it stays as the value from 0 to 1. And if you take a square root of a value from 0 to 1, it still stays a value from 0 to 1. So that makes applying all these functions super easy, right? So if I want to do some sort of like an easing uh, right in here uh, for the radius, I can just, you know, take a square of t. Like, can multiply uh, by t yet another time. Uh, right, and the size of the circle is going to behave non-linearly. It's going to behave like a square. So it's going to basically go from zero, but it's going to start ramping up very, very quickly. Actually, no, no, no. It's going to stall a little bit, and it's only going to become big closer to one. Right, so I, I think we should be able to see that. So I'm not quite sure. So uh, let's recompile this entire stuff. Yeah, so you see, it actually did the opposite to what we do. Uh, right, it started to make the big circle very later. We want to make them bigger a little bit earlier. Uh, right, and the way we can achieve that is by probably using sort of like an opposite function, which is the square root. So it becomes... Um, it makes more sense if you kind of visualize them, if you can just draw them. So you have the axis, right? And you have one in here and one in here. Uh, so this is sort of like the intersection, intersection and that's what it is. So here's how a linear function looks like. It just goes like this. Uh, square looks like this. And square root looks like this. So if instead of using lin the linear function we use square, it's gonna the circle is gonna stay very small for a long enough time until it ramps up very quickly and becomes full. So if we're gonna use a square root, it's gonna ramp up to be a big as soon as possible, and then it's gonna like stall being big until the full end. And this is roughly what we want, right? So because the thing I don't like about this visualization is that um, they become big too late. Right, so I want to see circles like around here. We still can see them, but it's just like, yeah, like they should become fuller a little bit earlier. And here it is kind of too late. Uh, so 
what we can do now, uh, it should be really straightforward. It should be really straightforward. It's kind of similar idea as in animation, uh, when you want to ease out some things. So let's just do a square root of this entire thing and a boom uh, and see. Yeah, that looks much better. Look at that. Look especially at this thing. Yeah. So that's exactly what I want. There's still, their size, their size still depends heavily on, um, you know, on the, um, on the actual value, right? So, but they become bigger much earlier, much earlier. So, and it just like looks nice. Um, so I really like that. We can do the same thing with thickness, by the way. Who said we cannot do that? Uh, because uh, quite often we have situations like this when the thickness is just like too small. Uh, all right, so it doesn't really look that nice. So let's go ahead and put square root here as well. Uh, there we go. So that looks a little bit nicer now. Uh, I'm not sure how it plays out with the, with the encoding and stuff like that, but I hope it, it, it works nice. Uh, so we can make the radius, we can even multiply the radius maybe by half. So maybe that's what we want to have in here. So they're now even bigger. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. So another problem that I have in here is that there's no anti-aliasing, which, which kind of sucks. Mm, there is a way to enable anti-aliasing for Rayleap, but that requires restarting the application. Which is fine, I guess. Um, which is totally fine. So in Rayleap, there is a flag that enables multi-sampling anti-aliasing. Right, there we go. So it's a flag MSA A for X hint. Uh, and you have to do that right before you initialize Rayleap. So let me find this entire thing. And where is the main initializer? So we have to put it somewhere here, but I don't remember the function that we have to call in here. So I know that that accepts config flags. So let me quickly use Google. Yeah, let's actually go ahead and use Google. Uh, so I'm going to do Google. So we know that this function accepts config flags. It's probably not going to return anything. So is there a function like that? So there is a... Oh, that's very interesting. I swear to God, if this function actually accepts integer instead of in, instead of config flag or something like that. Raysan, why? Why would you do something like that? Like, I swear to God if it is the case. Uh, just a second. I need to add Google to path. Um, is there something like... Okay, I'm gonna try to do config. Maybe there's something like config. Um, Huh? Maybe it's something like set config. Yeah, it's set config flags. Okay. Like, why? You have the type for the config flags. Why don't you use that type in the signature of the function to indicate, to sort of like for documentation purposes, to document like where things go? Like, why? What's the point of introducing that enumeration then? I'm disappointed. Uh, anyway, so what we have to do is uh, something like this, something like this. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. Um, let me recompile the entire stuff. Let me recompile the entire stuff. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's drag some music in here. All right, that looks much nicer now. Uh, we can take a look. Yeah, so there is a really weird bug in Rayleap when you enable like multi-sampling anti-aliasing. Spe specifically when you try to render the circles, right? The edges of the circles, they look anti-aliased, so, though they feel a little bit like shift, they don't feel really centered. Uh, right, but at the same time, they have these random pixels in here. And these pixels only appear when you enable multi assembly anti-aliasing, right? It's kind of weird. So I never looked into like what's exactly the problem in here, but if I understand correctly how Rayleap renders the circles, it actually interpolates the circles with uh, triangles, right? It literally tessellates the circle to the point where it looks like a circle and then renders the like a bunch of triangles in here. And maybe when you enable like 
multi-sampling, right? The math didn't assume, the math that tessellates the circles didn't assume that there will be more uh, samples in there and because of that there's some sort of gaps between the triangles, but this is just a hypothesis, I don't know for sure. Uh, I don't know exactly what's going on inside of the Rayleigh. But to be fair, we don't really have to use the stock function uh, to render circles in Rayleigh. We can render them use, uh, ourselves uh, using shaders, right? So essentially we can, instead of rendering the circle, we can literally render a texture and then we can create a custom shader which basically checks whether a particular fragment uh, that we're rendering is inside of the circle or outside of the circle and basically uh, renders that fragment or not renders that fragment. And fragment in this particular uh, case means like pixel. So it's super easy to render perfect circles inside of the shader. Uh, and that's what we can try to do. That's what we can try to do. Uh, right, but I want to try to do that after a small break because I've been coding for 45 minutes, right? So I really need to make a small break, uh, refill my tea and stuff like that. And after the break, we're going to continue and we're going to create a custom shader that uh, renders the circles perfectly without any uh, Ray Leap artifacts and stuff like that. And here is an interesting thing. Once you have shaders, right, you can do pretty cool stuff, right? We can even apply some sort of like a special effects uh, in the shaders, right? So yeah, I think it's gonna be interesting. So let's make a small break, and after the break, uh, we're gonna do all that. Um, all right, let's make some shaders, shall we? So first thing we need to do, we need to actually uh, render rectangles instead of, instead of circles, right? So because we're gonna be writing a GPU program that uh, is executed on each individual, <coughs> excuse me, on each individual pixel of that rectangle, and that shader program is going to decide whether that uh, pixel is going to be included in the circle or excluded, right? So essentially, this shader is going to carve out a uh, circle out of the rectangle, right? So, and because it's going to be executed on each individual pixel of the rectangle, um, it's going to always make the perfect circle, right? So it's not going to be interpolated with uh, triangles and stuff like that. So it's just depending on the size, it's always going to compute perfectly. Hopefully, that's the idea. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So I need to restart the, um, the game. <clears throat> it's not really a game, it's a visualizer. <laughs> but I mean, we're using the library for games, so maybe, maybe you can say it's a game. Uh, so... Let's go ahead. That looks nice. I really like that. <laughs> that looks so much nicer compared to what we had at the beginning. I absolutely love. Um, all right. So here is the circle. Here is the circle. So the start position is sort of like a center. Um, so which means that we just need to subtract uh, half of the right. Well, just radius and use width and height as the basically and set width and height to double of the radius, right? So if this is a center, we just move by diagonally by the radius and width and height is just like a diameter, like double of the radius. So that's basically what it is. So I wonder, I know that there is a rectangle type in Rayleigh and can I just say, give me a function that uh, accepts a rectangle but doesn't return anything, uh, right? And one more time and also it should accept uh, a cola I suppose uh, right so that's basically what I want in here yeah draw rectangle rect that's what it's called it accepts rectangle and accepts the color and just like draws it like that okay so that's what we need and that's what we need in here and we can now construct a rectangle so this is gonna be a rec and if I remember correctly, it accepts X and Y, so it's basically going to be start position X minus the radius, right? So this is the minus the radius, Y is also Y minus the radius, and width is double the radius, right? Width is double the radius. Uh, please hide, thank you very much. So let's try to compile the entire thing and see if it's going to do something. There we go, we have now uh, squares. They're not rectangles, but I mean, squares are special, special keys of the rectangle. All right, so that's pretty cool. <clears throat> so now we need to write a GPU program 
that is going to uh, process each individual pixel of the of the rectangle of the square. So uh, let's create a separate folder for shaders, right? So we already have folder for fonts, right? So we have some fonts in there, specifically Allegria. And uh, for the shaders, um, let's create circle and call it FS because it's a fragment shader. I don't remember what kind of parameters, um, what kind of parameters like fragment shaders accept in Rayleap. So maybe we can go into the Rayleap thingy. Uh, into the Rayleap source code and take a look at some of the examples. Do examples have uh, shaders? There we go. So we have some shaders. Uh, we have some shade S. Do we have te uh, textures? Not really textures, but um, fragments. Right, fragment shader. Well, I mean, maybe we want to take a look at the textures, right? Because textures usually work with fragment shaders. So uh, there we go. So we have something. Uh, cube spanning, yeah, right, so let me go to resources, GLSL, um, shaders, oh yeah, and uh, you may have different like versions of the shader language, so you have to be careful with that, but we're going to be using the OpenGL 3, 3.3 shaders, and uh, there is a base FS, maybe that's what we want to have in here, yeah, that's a good one, uh, so here, the shader accept the fragment uh, texture coordinates. Okay, that's nice. And the color, I suppose, the color that you pass, uh, that you pass to this function, right? So I suppose that's the color it accepts. So the output is the final color. So this particular shader also accepts some uniforms. I didn't think we need uniforms, right? So I didn't think we care about them. And uh, yeah, we just said the final color. Okay, so that, that looks nice. So I can just go to the circle and just copy paste this entire thing in here. Uh, I don't care about that. Add your custom variables in here. Thank you very much. And as the final color, let's set something like color uh, red. Right, so this is going to be color red. Uh, and let's go ahead and uh, load the shader. This requires changing the schema of the state of the plugin, right? So that means to add shaders in here, we'll have to restart the application. We, we can't really hot reload that entire stuff. All right, so let's go ahead and, and close it. Uh, right, and let's do shader, uh, shader, let's call it circle. And when we initialize the plugin, so as you can see here, uh, we are uh, loading the font, and on top of loading the font, we need to load the shader. Uh, so it's gonna be circle, load shader. If I remember correctly, uh, load shader. Um, so first argument is the vertex shader and the second one is the fragment shader. We don't really have a vertex shader, uh, we want to use the default one. And as far as I know, this function just allows you to do null, uh, right? And the only thing you have to provide is the path to the, to the fragment shader. So this is the circle and everything is fine in here. So I want to be able to hot reload the shaders as well, right? I want to be able to hot reload the shaders as well, and because of that, I think I need to update post reload hook, right? So essentially here, when the plugin has been reloaded, what I need to do, I need to unload and reload the shader again, right? So is there some function that unloads the shader? Unload, sh yeah, there we go. So that's literally what it is. So pre post reload, right? So here we reload it. So we're gonna accept the plug. Uh, circle, we just unloaded this entire thing and then uh, we reload it again. So that way, as we reload the plugin, we also reload the shader. Um, and with the shader, we don't even have to recompile the application, right? So, because the compilation of the shader happens at runtime. So, just by reloading the plugin, the same plugin, we also reload like a new version of the shader. Okay, that's actually nice. So, alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Um, so let's go ahead and rebuild this entire stuff and see if I didn't introduce any compilation errors. So that is fine. Uh, let's start the visualizer, visualizer. Okay, so how do we work with shaders? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I think there was like a begin shader. Oh yeah, there we go, begin shader mode. So let's go ahead and do that. Interestingly, Interestingly, I don't really care applying the shader to the sticks, to the bars. I only want to apply the shader to the 
uh, to the rectangles, which means that I need to actually do this sort of like rendering separately. So first I need to render the buzz, and second I need to render the rectangles. So I need to split that per, um, process a little bit. Uh, so might as well... I'm gonna copy paste the entire loop, I suppose. So here um, we can say we display the bars, right? So this is gonna be the bars. And I'm going to remove everything that is not related to the bars. So here is just a line. So I remove that. Radius is not needed, only the thickness. All right, makes sense, makes sense to me. And here is display the circles. So two separate things. So, and we're gonna display the circles between begin share mode plug circle in, and if I remember correctly, at the end, you have to say end shader mode, right? So you have to end that shader mode. So the lines are gonna be rendered with default shaders, but the rectangles, they're gonna be rendered with a special custom shader. Uh, so, and if we loaded the shader correctly, it should set the final color to red. So the red is gonna be an indicator that everything is loaded correctly. To be fair, that's another good indicator because red is usually associated with error. Let's actually render green. Uh, let's render green instead. And if we see the green, that means it's good. Uh, all right, so in case of, um, of the circles, we don't really care about the end position. We only care about the start position, which is effectively the center, right? So this is the center. We don't have the thickness, we don't draw the line, uh, and this is the center, and we just like draw it like that. So there we go, we successfully separated these two things. I hope, I hope so. Okay, boom. There we go. So that means now I should be able to simply change uh, the color. I can change it to blue, for instance, uh, and it automatically changes for all of them. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> right, that's actually pretty epic. Uh, so, and the color is actually computed on GPU, right? So this is the program that is executed on GPU. So if you ever wondered what, what is shader, right? Shader is a program that is uh, executed on GPU as an opposite to CPU. So that's what we call it. Uh, right, so, and since you're running on GPU, uh, you actually switch the paradigm of programming. Uh, usually if you're working on a CPU, you sort of like um, directly accessing the things, right? The parts of memory, right? So the CPU approach is you have a program that just basically visits each individual memory, like sequentially, or maybe like in separate thread and stuff like that. In case of, um, in case of the GPU, we write in a program that processes only one single pixel. It processes one single pixel and then we give it to GPU and it automatically uh, executes that program for each individual pixel of the rectangle simultaneously. Well, it's not really simultaneously, but it's, you can think of it as being executed simultaneously because uh, all of the instances of this program, they cannot interact with each other, right? So essentially you can only write a program that processes one single pixel and that is basically it. Uh, right, and you need to somehow uh, render a circle out of that, right? So you need to somehow render a circle out of that. And how do you do that? Well, you need to know the coordinates of the pixel. So the only thing you know, the only input you have is the coordinates of the pixel and maybe the color that you can pass this in here. We can actually just uh, actually forward that color like so. And I suppose we yeah, there we go. So we basically forward the color uh, that we get from from here, from CPU, right? So it back to being as it was. So since you only have the color that you got from the CPU and also the coordinates of the uh, of the texture, what you can do, you can essentially know in the center of the circle that you're rendering. You can check is the current coordinate within the circle or uh, outside of the circle. If it's within the circle, you set the color to the color. If it's outside, you set the color, the color to transparent, right? So you basically don't set anything. And this is how you basically draw the circle with this like a different paradigm, right? So you're not directly drawing the circle. Uh, you basically check 
where the particular pixel is within the circle or not and that's how the circle automatically is drawn out for you so that's how it works essentially so here we have a texture coordinates and i suppose it's a two-dimensional thing and texture coordinates right uh, they are normalized in the sense that x is going to be uh, uh, from zero to one right so this one doesn't really work uh, is it is this digital cell that's kind of weird uh, yeah there we go so let's actually do something like this. I want to sort of like decompose them so it's a little bit easier for us to work with that. Right, so all of them are from 0 to 1. And to check that this is true, let's actually set the color like so. Uh, we're going to set red to X, y, uh, green to Y, and we're not going to set the blue, and we're going to set the alpha to 1. So essentially, X coordinate is going to be responsible for red, and Y coordinate is responsible for green, so and on the right top corner we're going to have yellow so it's going to result in this very interesting gradient of three colors uh red green and yellow which looks like a mango i usually call it uv mango <laughs> right so it's a usual test that the graphics programmers do to check whether their like um, texture coordinates are correct or not they're drawing the uv mango uh so if we manage to see uv mango uh, that means everything is correct and if we don't that means something is incorrect well, something is incorrect. I wonder if I can find uh, like an example. Uh, if I Google UV Mango, will I find uh, something? UV. <laughs> okay, UV uh, shaders. Uh, and let's do Google. Mm, simple Mango UV quad is wrong. Yeah mango in quotation marks uh yeah this is how it's supposed to look like so the, the, this is uv mango so essentially in the uh, left top corner uh, left bottom corner you have to have black here you have to have uh yellow green um red and green um so and we don't see that so we're supposed to see a little mango in each individual square but we don't so something is wrong in here and I think I, I know what. So essentially, the fragment shaders in Raydeep work properly only if you use them for textures. Right. So when you do them on shapes, then they don't really work properly. I think it doesn't pass the texture coordinates correctly. Uh, so, and to pass texture coordinates correctly, you need, you really, literally need to pass a texture there. So we can create some sort of like a dummy texture and just like draw a square using like draw by drawing texture, which is kind of a dumb solution, but it's nothing unheard of. In fact, uh, in Rayleap, there is a default texture. Uh, yeah, default texture. Wait, default. Yeah. So essentially, one default texture to D is loaded. Uh, which is basically one by one white pixel, right? So, and it is one by one white pixel precisely for this kind of situation, right? So when you just need to draw like like a texture, but you don't care about the texture, right? So the, 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 the whole texture is going to be computed in the, in the shader itself, right? So you need some sort of a placeholder. Um, so, but if I remember correctly, it is not available that easily from like Rayleap. You, you cannot have default texture. Yeah, you can't have that. So you literally have to like construct it from scratch. So, oh boy, Rayleap. Um, okay, so let me find. I'm going to try to grab default texture. Um, I think it's also texture default or something. Uh, all right, so texture. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Oh yeah, here it is. So uh, yeah, you can only get its OpenGL ID, uh, RL get texture ID default. But which, what we actually need in here, what we actually need is texture 2D, right? So we need the texture 2D. So essentially you have to construct this entire thing yourself. So you have to set the ID to the default texture. Uh, width and height to one um, and meet maps I don't really know what you have to set this to but we can try to search for how this particular function is used 
Right, so is it used anywhere within the source code of Rayleigh? Uh, right. So, oh yeah, there we go. So look at that, uh, just a second. So this is how you construct it. <laughs> so yeah, if you're not sure how to use a particular function, just grab for that function and see how it is used in the source code, right? Because the usage of the function within the source code is the best documentation. So it's just like demonstrate you, this is how we're supposed to use this function. And that is supposed to give us the, the texture, the default texture. So maybe it makes sense to save it, oh, maybe not, I don't freaking know. So let's construct that texture on each individual frame every time. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, Plug.c and uh, we're gonna put that somewhere here. So this is the texture. So something like this. And uh, let's find some functions that render the texture. So can we draw, uh, draw texture? Uh, texture, yeah. But we need to be able to scale the texture. So, yeah, so we probably want to use draw texture XC. Uh, and we can even pass the uh, the color in here. That's actually pretty cool. So we're going to provide the texture. So position, I suppose, is going to be... Yeah, position has to be this one. Uh, so let me construct it real quick. So this is going to be position. Uh, and it's simply center X minus radius so this is going to be x this is going to be y and this is y there we go so this is the position we are not planning to rotate anything in terms of scale this one is interesting so since it's a one by one we actually need to scale it yeah we can just scale it by the size that we want and the size that we want is two radius right and the color that we can pass in there is just going to be the color uh, of the thing that we're trying to draw so let me try to do that now. Um, so that should probably work. Yeah. So if I go to the semicolon. Oh yeah, this thing is located somewhere within um, RLJL. So RLJL is basically a wrapper around several versions of OpenGL. I think we can even read the description of what is RLGL. Uh, RLGL. So a multi-OpenGL abstraction layer with an immediate mode style API, right? So essentially, uh, if you feel nostalgic about OpenGL 1.1 immediate API, you can just use this thing and it will work on even, even on the latest versions of OpenGL, right? So just like a wrapper around this thing. So it's sort of like cross-platform API. It works across several OpenGL APIs. Which is freaking ironic because, because OpenGL is supposed to be the abstraction layer. So we're putting abstraction layer on top of abstraction layer because we have too many abstraction layers. Anyway, uh, software development in 2023, am I right? So, um, so what do we have in here? Rotation, and we're not going to rotate anything, so it's going to be zero. So we have an used rectangle. Um, I'm going to comment it out. So comment it out and bring this thing in here. So maybe we'll go back to this stuff. Maybe not, probably not. Uh, there we go. So now we can see a perfect mango. So yeah, it actually passes the coordinates. So the, uh, the black one is a left top, but OpenGL coordinates imply that the black one has to be the bottom one. So it tries to sort of like a, Mm, that's fine. I think we can work with that. So that's totally fine. Um, so let's go back to the circle. FS, and what can we do? We can... Yeah, we can do literally the thing that I said. Uh, so essentially, the, uh, the square of x plus the square of y. Mm, we probably want to find the, diff the distance from the center. And since they are from 0 to 1, the center is half. Uh, so the distance from the center is going to be this right so this is the distance from the center and then we can check whether it's less or equal than the radius and in our case the radius let's say is going to be half uh right and if it is we set the core of the mango otherwise we just set to zero right so let's actually set it to zero like so uh boom and that didn't freaking work which is quite surprising um, that is the most bizarre shice I've ever seen in my entire life. Why is it not working? 
why is it not twerking? Because you have to compare this entire stuff to the square of the radius. There we go. So that's very interesting. It is circle now. Huh. So yeah, that's how we do that. But we can actually set the actual color in here, uh, frag color, uh, right? And we will get back to the original thing that we had. So, but it should actually... It's not even anti-aliased properly, god fucking damn it, anyway, so... <laughs> but we can now try to anti-alias it. Right, so essentially, uh, we can... We can know... Uh, how much we are inside of the circle and how much we are outside of the circle. Right, so essentially we can compute the length. I think it would be... Yeah, it would be easier to actually use the vector operation. So one of the cool things you can do in, uh, in GLSL is that you don't have to work on the level of separate sort of floats, right? You can work on a level, level of whole vectors. So by just doing texture coordinate, you can say minus uh, 0, 0.5. Actually, you can do vector 2, right? And that automatically computes sort of like the center, right? We can save this thing to a separate variable, for example, p. Um, and then we can do, all right, um, length p less than r, and it's going to work, right? So it's almost like a Fortran. Yeah, it's almost like a Fortran where you have array operations. Here you have vector operations. So, interestingly, um, if we take the length of P, right, the length of this vector, um, and essentially subtract a radius, so if this thing is inside of the circle, that specific value, that specific value, maybe we can call it S, uh, is going to be negative. If it's outside of the circle, it's going to be positive, right? Uh, so essentially, we can quite easily check if s is less or equal than zero, that means it's inside. If it's greater than zero, that means it's outside. So, and essentially, um, the smaller this value is, um, uh, the smaller this value is, the closer it is to the center, right? The closer it is to the center. In fact, um, we can even compute how much closer it is to the center. So let me actually try to recompile and just check that. Yeah, so I didn't make any mistakes in here. Um, so one of the things we can do, we can create some sort of like a glow effect. So essentially, um, if it is precisely inside of the circle, uh, it's gonna be, you know, solid color then we can create some sort of aura around this entire thing right some sort of aura around this entire thing and make a gradient that goes uh, towards the edges right and that will kind of create like a glow effect and i think it will make the whole look a little bit more interesting like imagine this thing not being just like circles but also glowing a little bit with their corresponding colors uh i think i think that would be nice so let's give it a try so but we need to leave a little bit of a room for for the glow, right? Because, for example, if I set the color of the background of this entire thing to red, uh, we'll see something interesting. We don't really have that much room for the glow, right? We don't have really that much room for the glow. So we need to make the circle smaller, I suppose. Uh, we can make it like twice as small, uh, right? So we can make it twice as small. But now it is too small. Right, so we have some room for the glow, but now it is too small. So if we just go back to rendering nothing in the background, uh, right, it's just like it's not the original look and feel that I was going for. So we can try to fix that on the level of the CPU. Uh, so we can just make the radius twice as bigger, right? So in that case, it's probably going to be just three. So let's recompile this entire thing, and yeah, now it is bigger, now it is as the original uh, thing, but we should be having more space for the glow. Yeah, as you can see, there is much more space for the glow, which is super nice, I really like that. 
Uh, okay. So what we can do with that space? Let me see. Uh, so it should be it should be here essentially. Um, essentially, essentially, uh, we want to normalize that value. We want to normalize that value. Um, what is the maximum possible value for s? What is the maximum possible value for s? We have to really think about that. Uh, so let's actually draw uh, the entire stuff. We have some sort of a circle in here. Right, and we know that on the edges in here, the S is going to be equal to zero. And it's going to become positive outside of this thing and negative here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, right, so the maximum value we should think is basically half, right, which is sort of the maximum, the maximum radius you can have, right? So this is half, so this entire thing. Uh, minus the radius of the circle, minus the radius of the circle. And that's the maximum value this thing could be. Um, though we also need to um, cut out these sort of corners, right? So we need to cut out these sort of corners, but they should be relatively easy to cut out. We, we can have like an extra condition. So yeah, right. We need to cut out these sort of corners and only then consider this to be maximum value of S. And once we do that, we can do something like this and we get an interpolator which we can use for creating a gradient. So that's basically the idea. That's, I think that's a good idea. Uh, right, so let's first carve out the sort of like the, the edges. Uh, I think that's quite important. Um, how can we do that? Is there an easy way to do that to be fair? Mm -hmm. Well, to be fair, it should be basically length p um, less or equal than half of five. So essentially, we have like a outer circle and then inner circle. Uh, right, that's actually quite funny. <laughs> right, so let's do it like that. Maybe there is an easy way to do that, but I mean, uh, we have a, quite a few branches, which may slow down the shader, but we're not trying to be super performant right now. Uh, yeah, there we go. So we cut out the the outer circle and within um, The inner circle we can quite easily do okay. This is half minus the radius uh, and we divide s By that value because that's the maximum value and we have t Which we can straight up use for uh, for alpha because it's from 0 to 1 which now since we use the color red is gonna be like a red uh, you know gradient yeah, okay, this one is interesting because because it's growing, right? So we need to do the opposite. That actually looks kind of cool. It lo this looks like a bubble. Wait a second. This is not the look I'm going for, but I think I'm going to take a note. So to create a bubble, you sort of like invert... Okay. So and if you add additional, um, like, um, white circle, you can create like a reflection. It's going to be a re reflective one. That's a very cool one. Uh, and if you make it white, for instance. Huh. Looks like... like, like how it looks like. Uh, okay, so uh, let's make it red again. And we need to invert this gradient. So I suppose uh, we can just do minus one, which will effectively invert it. And yeah, look at that. So it is gradient now. It is a gradient now. Um, so, and now what if we use the color uh, of the fragment that we pass from the CPU. So fragment color uh, X, Y, Z. And we're going to swizzle that a little bit. Uh, they look fuzzy now. Look at them. They don't look like they're glowing. They look more like they're fuzzy. And the reason why they look like that, we can actually increase their size. Uh, we can only increase their size from the CPU. So let's make something like four. Yeah. The reason why they look fuzzy is because the gradient is linear. Yeah. Linear interpolations, they rarely look good. They rarely look natural. Well, I mean, if we, we what we want to create is fuzziness, maybe it's fine. But for the glow, it actually... 
let's try different interpolations. We can do the same thing as we did with the sizes with SQRT. We can try to apply SQRT there as well and see how it's gonna go. So we can just literally say SQRT, SQRT, uh, T, and ah, uh, where's the compilation? And see if it's going to. Oh, okay. So it actually made it even more. Yeah, yeah, because the square root, it yeah, it ramps up very quickly, so it became even more solid. We need the opposite thing. Right, so it needs to decrease very quickly. Uh, so let's go ahead and try to do that so we can take a square of that. Uh, is it gonna look... All right, that looks a little better. You know what's interesting is that we can use not only square, uh, we can use a cube. I don't have to rebuild because it's shaded, but anyway. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, what if I made this thing smaller even yeah okay so that's cool um let's try to experiment with yeah the, the cool thing is that the more squares like the more power you have the more tight it becomes i think that's what it does right so it's too spread out if we want to make it a little bit tight we just like increase the power uh Right, and it becomes a little bit tight, and it now looks more like it's glowing. And we can make it even more tight by taking the, the cube. And the more, like, powers we uh, layer out, the, the more tight it becomes. Uh-huh. So, and the smaller the radius, the more spread out is going to be at the end. So we can try to do something like this. So it's very small, but then we can increase its size by just increasing it on the CPU, increasing the hours thing in there. So we can just like increase the hour stuff. Uh, maybe even like eight. Right. Uh, so I don't know, maybe we can make it a little bit bigger. All right. So it doesn't really look like it's glowing in the sense that I think the center has to be brighter. Mm, one of the things we can do, we can multiply the center by like a half or something. That's not a bad idea, actually. It's not a bad idea. Huh. What if 25? But it's, I think it's a little bit too bright. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. Now, now we can experiment with those things and just see how they go. Oh, that looks nice. So that's so cool. <laughs> uh, holy shit, that's so nice. <laughs> it's, um, it's such a simple math, right? It's just like this interpolation and stuff like that. And again, this idea of the normalized values from 0 to 1 they're like, this is the most sort of important idea of computer graphics. And this is something that I even make a video on, right, didn't I? Uh, I have a video, like the most important idea in computer graphics. Uh, I think it was about Olivets, right? And uh, yeah, so this is something that I discussed there. Um, right. Oh my God, it's so slow. But yeah. YouTube sodium most important idea. I think we should be able to find that. Um, yeah, this one, the most important idea in computer graphics. So, and I talked about that there. I think that idea of this interpolator from 0 to 1 is the most important idea in computer graphics, uh, because it pops up literally every time I do any computer graphics. Uh, let me put it in here. So, baby, most important. Alright, so uh, this looks cool, you know, but this is not the only sort of idea I wanted to apply. Uh, it looks visually interesting already, right? So it creates sort of like an interesting mood, right? It feels like it's night, though I feel like night is not particularly, um, you know, dark enough. So let me take a look at the clear background so maybe we can try to make it a little bit more dark 
Uh, wait. I'd like to make it a little bit more. Yeah, okay, so that, that's a little bit better. So it's it's night and it's sort of like some, you know, fireflies are glowing and stuff like that. So it looks cool. It creates a really interesting cool. But it's not particularly dynamic enough, right? It's not particularly dynamic enough. Uh, one of the ideas I was playing with is basically for those sort of like fireflies to have some sort of a trail, right? Which indicates in which direction they're moving. I think it is it is interesting idea to try to implement, right? So let me. Oh, that's actually cool. It's kind of funny how they they stop, right? So because yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So they, they reach their final destination just like stopping there. That's that's so cool. I like that. Uh, okay, so uh, let me demonstrate you. So on top of just having these sort of like flowers, uh, they have a certain velocity, right? They have certain velocity and they're moving in a particular direction. What if when this thing is moving in a particular direction, it is going to have like this additional trail, right? That looks like this. And the faster it is moving in a particular direction, the longer the trail it has, right? So this way they feel a little bit more like gooey and more sort of like, I don't know, like natural, not particularly natural, I don't know what, what kind of word I can say. Uh, organic, that's the word I'm looking for. They look sort of like organic. They're also glowing and they have this sort of trail. And uh, I think it will provide enough of interesting things on the screen to look at, to to be stimulating, right? So because with these kind of things, you want to be interesting and stimulating, but not overwhelming, right? So I'm trying to come up with enough interesting things on the screen to uh, sort of retain the attention, but not overwhelm. Um, and I think this last touch uh, would be perfect for this kind of visualization, right? So the, if they're standing, they don't really have any trail, but then when they're quickly moving up or falling down they should have some sort of a trail that indicates like where they're coming from and stuff like that so the question is how can we implement something like that that's a very interesting question we can basically implement it in a sense of the particle system right on each frame we can take a snapshot of the uh, of this thing uh, and always surrender a particle in that place and slowly fade it out that way they will create kind of like trail, but the, the, the trail is going to consist of the shadows of itself, of snapshots, which I don't really particularly like. I want it to be like solid thing, right? Because usually these kind of trails end up being looking like this, right? They look like this. And it's just like, it doesn't look particularly good. It looks for, look for certain situations, but what I'm going for is, I think animators have a term for that. I'm going for smear frames. Do you know what is a smear frame? This is already the second animation concept that I'm bringing up. The first one is in functions, right? So, and the second one is a smear frames. So essentially we're doing like a literal like animation in here. <laughs> so smear frames, uh, that's what I'm going for. I'm going for smear frames. And it's sort of like an intermediate, yeah. These are the intermediate frames that look weird. So essentially you have an object in a position A and a position B and you need to animate, not only really animate, but convey a quick rapid motion from A and B within few frames, like one, two frames. So if you just like move objects as snapshots, it's not going to convey motion really well. So what the animators came up with is a smear frame. They stretch and smear the object within few frames, creating an illusion of rapid motion from A and B. And this is how they look like, right? So sometimes if you pose some cartoons, they, they look weird like that. And that's what they are. So these kind of things, th these kind of things have a name. They're called smear frames. And this is what I'm going for, right? So I want to have smear frames rather than an actual trail. So that would have been perfect, I think. That would have been perfect. So, and I think it is super easy to create such smear frames. Uh, essentially what we can do, we can 
take half of the circle, right? We can take half of the circle as a texture, right? And just stretch the hell out of it. And that will create a smear frame for, for that specific circle. And since we're rendering the circles already, we can use the same shader as we use for this specific circle. Those, yeah, those, even the, the trail itself is going to have some sort of like a glow. Right, so, so I think that's, that's a particularly good idea, right. Um, so, but the question is, how do we determine how much we want to stretch this entire thing? That's another interesting question. Um, I have the following idea. So essentially, we can use the same trick as we used to smooth out uh, the immediate uh, snapshots of the frequencies, right? So essentially, on each frame, we have immediate snapshots of the frequencies. And we don't really display them. We don't really display them. We use them to compute velocities for the current frequencies that we're uh, sort of keeping track of. And we're updating it according to that velocity, like moving towards these frequencies, but not setting them to those frequencies. Um, if we create a third, second degree smoothing, we're going to basically have an additional point that follows the current frequency. So the frequency itself just follows the immediate frequency, but we create additional thing that follows that following frequency, it will create an additional trail. And that could be the indication where the smear, smear ends. So it doesn't really make much sense, but let me try to code that and we'll see if it will start making sense. Um, all right, so let me, uh, let me go there. Uh, so here's we're playing all of that stuff. Uh, so uh, let's create an another thing uh, smear. So this is going to be n. And where do we compute smoothing? Right. So here's the smoothness, and essentially smear is similar, except the target of smear is the smoothing. Right. It is the smoothing, uh, like so. Uh, I'm going to multiply it by. Let's actually do, let's make it s slower so we can actually see that. So let me try to recompile. So, okay, we can clearly see everything. And now as we render the circles, right, as we render the circles, I also want to render this thing, but I need to render them outside of the shader mode. So I suppose what I want to do in here is copy paste this iteration one more time. So we're going to be drawing this smear. To be fair, I don't particularly care about hue saturation value, so the color in this case is going to be just red. Right, so this is going to be red, so this is the center of this thing. The radius is going to be um, a stable, right, so let's not make it too big. Um, so, yeah, so let's make it like equal to the cell width. Uh, and the position... Um, so, essentially, I just want to render the, uh, the circle, right, so that's what I want. Draw. Uh, circle. I think it's circle V. There we go. So this is going to be center, uh, radius, and color. So that should be enough to see those trails. Yeah. There we go. So we can make their uh, their size a little bit smaller. So let's actually make them half uh, of the cell bits because I think they're too big. Uh, right. Uh, maybe 75 and I would like to maybe yeah yeah as you can see they basically say where the smear frame has to end so if we basically render the line between the main uh, glow thing and the red one it's gonna be clear the the actual smear frame is gonna become like literally visible essentially um so they're actually moving very slow but we can control that we can control them in a uh in the same way as we control smoothness right so here is the smoothness uh and here we can have this smearness <laughs> and let's say it's gonna be like five uh so this is gonna be smearness uh, and so they are now actually following a little bit faster right so they're a little bit snappier uh which is good uh maybe uh, 
to snap, let's say. All that is controllable, effectively. Yeah. All that is very much controllable. So, uh, and essentially, what it creates, it creates the end point for our smear frame, right? So, essentially, that particular point, that particular red point, tells us the end of that smear. It tells us the end of that smear. And knowing the end, so here is the where it begins and here is where it ends, we can just construct a rectangle and render the texture of how we circle, right? And depending on like where this point is located, we're gonna just like render it differently, but we'll have to uh, swap the texture all the time, all right? But that's not that big of a deal. So th that's the simplest trick I could, could come up with, right? So I spent some time actually figuring out how to do this kind of thing, and that's the best thing I came up with. <laughs> Uh, I think it's kind of good, uh, right, so, and, yeah, feel free to use that trick whenever you need to. Uh, right, and spear frames are actually very powerful technique, let me tell you. That's why the animators always use them all the time. Uh, so, and by the way, smear frames is one of the reasons why, like, 64, um, 64... Is it 64? 60, 60 FPS uh, like AI interpolators for the videos don't work on cartoons really well, um, right? Because those smear frames were designed for a specific uh, frame rate. And then you're trying to upscale frame rate to 60 FPS and it the AI also tries to upscale the smear frames and it turns usually into mess, right? It's kind of difficult to <laughs> upscale smear frames, so which is kind of interesting, right? Because like... FPS usually in in the animations, FPS usually not the limitations, but also it, it's a limitation, but it's a limitation that is integrated into the animation intent, right? By changing the FP, FPS, you actually have to animate it differently. The intent of the animation becomes different. So this is one of the reasons why some of the new 3D cartoons actually are animated at lower frame rate because with the lower frame rate, it's easier to create a specific intent. If that makes any sense, I'm not sure if it does. I'm not a professional animator, but I know about easing functions and uh, smear frames, right? So, which maybe makes me kind of like an animator. And also, you see animated things on the screen, so maybe... I don't know, right? I'm, 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 I don't know what I'm talking about. So anyway... Um, let's try to see what we can do. Let's try to connect the uh, actual point, um, you know, the point of the end with the center of the glowing thingy. Let's go ahead and do that. So, uh, we can call it B, which is basically begin, uh, right, and this is T, B. So, this is the center of the begin. We can call it like a start position. So, this is a start position. Um, Maybe we can call it start. There we go. And we need to have end which is out smooth. There we go. And let's replace start with end. And we have start and end, believe it or not. Uh, now we can do draw uh, line. Can we do draw line V? Start position, end position. Um, and the color, right? So I just want to be able to see those things, like uh, these trails. Um, so this is, I suppose, start position. So we use smear as the start. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, we can we can clearly see them. Just a second. So if we will pause. Right. So this thing. Oh yeah, we're using the array leap uh, way of rendering circles. That's why there's some artifacts. But it's just like for debugging purposes. So this thing is obviously going up, and that's why this trail is like going down. Right. So you can think of it as as a string. Right. So it's like a uh, thing on the string, and these things are swinging it. Right. They're sort of swinging it all the time. I think something more dynamic would make sense. Something like fly away. Oh yeah, look at that. That looks so nice. I really like that. Okay, that's pretty cool. They're literally, literally swinging them. Look at them. They're literally swinging them. <laughs> right, so this is a perfect technique for creating this sort of like a trails. 
Um, okay. So what we want to do now, we want to turn this two point into a rectangle into which we can fit the texture. So let's go ahead and try to do that. Um, so the, the problem with the rectangle is that they, um, they cannot have, in Rayleigh, they cannot have negative width and height, which makes it kind of difficult when, for example, end is bigger than the start um, or smaller than the start. It's just like depends on how we, we think about it. Yeah. So it's a little bit pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. So um, let's try to construct this thing somehow. We can, um, anyway. So rectangle, uh, rectangle, this is gonna be a rec. And X is basically, so let's construct it based on the start and end position, right? So start position, uh, is x minus some sort of a radius and we can basically use this as a radius right so this is the radius uh, and then y y doesn't really have to be yeah y can be uh, just the usual y the width is going to be the twice of the radius that we constructed it's not really a radius but i mean i just call it radius for the reason and uh, we're going to assume the end point is bigger. So because of that, it's going to be y minus start position y. And here is the rectangle. And in here, what we want to do, we want to just like fill that rectangle. Right. So it's going to be draw a rectangle. I think it's a rec. Right. So it's going to be a rec. And we're going to use the code in here. So let me see. So it's not uh, w, it's width. And this is height. All right, so what do we have in here? And okay, it kind of works, but only when it's going down. Look at that. All right, it works only when it's going down because again, uh, the the width and height. Yeah, th that's so fucking cool. Look at that. So it's already like a trail. You can just make it maybe a little bit bigger, a little bit thicker. All right, so let's make it a little bit thicker, and you can make it the same color as the color, like the current color. Uh, so how do we compute the color? So there is a hue, yeah, yeah, so there is the whole hue saturation value thing. Though saturation and value everywhere is the same, which probably means that we want to make them kind of global, like the same for all of these things. Uh, saturation, so value, saturation, so it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, so, uh-huh. So the color yeah, redefinition, let's remove that. Uh, yeah, it's kind of difficult to see them, but when they're going down, they're the same color. It's already like a trail. So you just need to draw like a correct texture onto it, basically. All right, so that's nice. Um, so this makes sense. This makes sense only if end is bigger. Uh, only if end is like end position y is bigger than end start position y. So we can try to do it like that. If end is bigger than start, only then do it like that. All right. So because we need to do the swap. Uh, uh, I think I killed it. Right. So it doesn't really work at all now. Um, so end, it's kind of weird. Is that because, you know what? I think this is what we have to do. We have to do end position Y bigger than start position Y. Maybe even equal, let's make it equal. Yeah, so now it works. So, and otherwise we just like, we're gonna be computing the rectangle slightly differently. Um, so how are we going to be computing the rectangle otherwise? So x is going to be the same, y is going to be the same. I suppose uh, maybe we're going to just use end position instead. And this is going to be start and end position. Something like this. But it doesn't... Oh, unused variable. Uh -huh, this is because we don't draw anything. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's fine. So now we have the trail. 
Oh, look at that. That is so freaking awesome, man. It's it's already loose cool. <laughs> it's already a trail. It's it's a little bit too like long. We can may maybe make it short. Right, so we can increase the smearness. Smearness. Uh right, so it's a little bit tight. So it's gonna be end up in a shorter. Uh-huh, we can control that. We can make it six maybe. Yeah, something like that. So, and essentially, we just need to draw like a half of a circle into it. But we can only do the shader stuff uh, on textures. So we can't just, we can't just use this kind of thing. Which is a little bit pain in the ass. So as far as I know, there is uh, a special function in Relief for textures. Draw texture. Uh, that, yeah, I think it's a draw texture pro. Uh -huh, we can try to use that. Draw Texture Pro, but it accepts too many different things. It accepts the texture, it accepts the source, so you can actually draw the sub texture of the other texture and the destination, and that's the destination that we want to actually supply, right? So this is what we want to be the destination. And to be fair, source, having source is not that bad of an idea. Right? It's needed for basically atlases, when you have a single texture that contains several textures, so you can take a subtexture and render a single frame of animation or something like that. And this is something that we can use, because we need to draw only half of a circle. So we can use that uh, ability to just pick the correct smear frames, so that, that should be fine. Uh, but for now, I think I'm gonna set the source to just... Um, from 0, 0, 1, 1, because the default texture is 1 by 1 pixel. Uh, so the texture in here is just the texture. The origin, I think origin is basically just like how you're gonna rotate it if you provide the rotation. So since we're not rotating, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Alright, so the origin is just like nothing, whatever. I uh, can't see scheisse in this mist. Uh, so an intent is the, the color that we provide, right? So that's basically what we want. So origin is going to be the same probably for everyone. The source though is going to be different, right? Because we're going to be flipping that thing. Uh, okay, go. So let's render the texture. Uh, eh, the use of undeclared destination. Oh yeah, because I renamed only one thing. I didn't rename the second thing. Uh huh. So yeah, it seems to be working right. So we're just rendering default texture with different stuff. Uh, let me. Yeah, let me double check. Uh, can I set the color to maybe green? Where is the color? I don't see the color. So just to confirm that everything is correct. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah okay, everything is correct. That's for sure. So let's go back. Uh huh. There we go. So that's pretty cool. So let's slap the shader on top of this entire thing right so if we just enable the shader for this stuff it should automatically create like a circle-ish uh trails i'm not sure how it's gonna look like i think it's gonna look awful right because it's not half of the circle so we're gonna use the full circle yeah and the circle is actually very small uh, yikes so yeah we need to we need to make this, the inner circle a little bit bigger. You can kind of see it. Just a second. Maybe, yeah, yeah. You, you can kind of see it. So here it is. Here is the small trail. But it just doesn't look good because we intentionally set... Uh, we intentionally set a small circle in here. And the reason is because we make a very big texture, right? So we can demonstrate what I mean right, by setting it to red. So, yeah, it only makes sense when your entire texture is huge like that. Only then it makes sense. But the trail itself is not that huge. That's why it's like not applicable, unfortunately. So I feel like we need to create like a separate shader specifically for the for the trail. That's what I feel like because it, it, it's gonna have different parameters. We could have used the same shader if we knew how to pass these parameters. So we can't use uni u uniforms because these are parameters per circle, right? So they're not uniform. 
each individual circle, each individual bar is going to have its own parameters, so we can't use uniforms for that. We need to have separate attributes, and I could not be bothered figuring out how to do additional custom attributes in Raylip, so... <laughs> Really, it was kind of cool at the beginning when you only started, but when you go in deeper, deeper and more advanced, you, you kind of feel like it's limiting you. Right, you, you want to have more control. And this is probably why they have RLGL layers, so for you to have more control, and maybe I need to dive into that. But yeah, so I think I'm slowly growing out of Rayleap, so at some point I'll need to write my own sort of like an engine on top of Ray on, on top of OpenGL. So I can have a full control and make my own renderers and stuff like that. So, but I mean, for the beginning, it's it's kind of nice. Uh, okay, so yeah, so let's do a quick dirty hack by literally copy pasting this shader and call it smear fs, right? So this is gonna be smear fs, and uh, let's create smear in here. So, and we have to load it twice when we are initializing, um, right, when we're initializing and when we are reloading. When we are reloading, we should not forget to unload the smear and load it again. So, something like this. But that will require restarting the whole application, which I don't really mind. Not that big of a deal. Not that big of a deal. Uh, all right, so let's restart this entire stuff and... What do we get? Um, so let's start playing some Yuzak. Uh, where is Pilotson? Okay. Mm -hmm. So circle smear. So now we have a separate shader for the smear, which means that we can now control uh, this entire stuff, right? For instance, we can make the circle itself way bigger. Uh, yep. So, which results in, well, I'm modifying the wrong shader, <laughs> god damn it. I meant to modify smear. Uh, yeah, so, there we go. So, it's, I can make that thing way bigger. There we go. Now we can at least see it. All right, so now it, it, it's at least visible. So, what if, what if we make it like half? Oh, look at that. That is so nice. Okay, look at that beauty. Look at that beauty. That is beautiful. Half is too is too much, I think, uh, because we need to have some space for the glow, right? Don't we? Yeah, we want to have some space for the glow. Uh, now, yeah, but this in this case, glow results in some sort of anti-aliasing, I suppose. All right. So maybe maybe three. I mean, anti-aliasing is basically very narrow glow, isn't it? I think basically, yeah. <laughs> so. But it doesn't really look exactly as I want it to look because, um, right, it's not half, it's a full circle, right? It's not particularly helpful. Um, so, and maybe we can make it a little bit more spread. So what if I just like make it linear in here? Uh, I, I can't see if it's good enough. Yeah, I think that's, that's fine. For, for the trail, I think linear interpolation looks fine. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. Uh, but if, if needed, we can always change that. So now, now, can we modify the source? So I suppose zero, zero is the left top one. So, and if we go in, um, ah, God damn it. So essentially what we have to do, we have to take like a half of the, uh, of this thing. Did it work? I think, I think it worked when it goes up or maybe down. It's hard. I think it's when it's go yeah when it's going down it's actually pretty perfect I don't like that. Uh, so we need something like um there is a very good sample by no that I absolutely love it's just an obstacle in my way it's it's probably one of my favorite yeah when they're going up and down it's just like yeah it's just yeah I think when they're going down it's when uh, okay let me restart all right, so when they're going down, they actually kind of perfect. Look at that. This is really good. All right, so I think I nailed it for going down. So for going up, I need to grab the different part of the circle. So in that sense, um, 
this is the top half. What I have to do is just this thing, but lower it down a little bit. Okay, I think I, I think I know it. <laughs> One more time. Ah! Let's restart it one. I want to capture the moment when there is up and down. All right, so this is perfect. We have up and we have down. I think, okay, so you can clearly see that they are too big. They're too big. So we can try to maybe reduce them in here, right? So let's actually make 25. Uh, I think that's perfect. So there's something weird going on here. Uh, let me try... It. I know what is going on. The These things don't scale according to the, you know, the height. So I think they have to scale according to the end. How are we going to be scaling them? Uh, we can just like a, uh, multiply it by a radius in here. Yeah. So though we're not using uh, linear scaling, we're using security F. I'm sorry that I'm repeating the same sample over and over again, but it's it's important to capture All right, everything. Yeah, sometimes... I think it's fine. I think they have to be behind uh, the circles. All right, to, to make sense, actually. So, let me take the smears uh, and put them behind this thing. So we want to render them um, before the circles, like so. So it looks a little better. One more time. Uh, I think this is perfect. Maybe, to be fair, this Making this stuff a little bit brighter is too much. Do we make it a little bit brighter within the smear as well? We kind of do. So let's not make it brighter anywhere. So maybe that's that's the key. Okay, that's that looks good. I like it. So, I think they may be moving too fast, but I mean, in case of the chip tune, they always like close to each other, so it's kind of difficult to see uh, the dynamic stuff. So, oh my god, this is perfect. I really like that. This is so good, holy shit. <laughs> uh, Alright. Okay, let's restart it. I just looked back at the recording and when it's full screen it looks horrible. I really apologize for that. <laughs> uh, like I was like looking at absolutely pixelated, you know, mess and being like, oh my god, it looks so beautiful. <laughs> that was the funniest shit ever actually, but yeah. Uh, so, but trust me, it looks very good in the full screen. So, and one of the things we're gonna do in the future, actually, uh, we're gonna do like a full high resolution, high FPS rendering via FMPEG 
Uh, so then you can maybe like use it to for a YouTube video or something. I don't know. Uh, right, but we're gonna do that already on the next recreation or programming session with Azus. So that's it for today. Thanks everyone who's watching right now. I really appreciate that. Have a good one, and I see you all on the next recreation programming session with Azus. Of course, yeah. Love you all. Mwah.